Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Hargreaves Services PLC Preliminary Results Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Just simply type in your questions at any time and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. Uh, before we begin, we'd like to submit the following poll, and as usual, I'm sure the company would be most grateful for your participation. And I'd now like to hand over to CEO Gordon Bannum. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, and welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for taking the time to review the preliminary results for Hargreaves. Um, today, I'm joined by John Samuel, Group FD, who will cover the financial review. And then supporting me on the operating review is David Anderson, who's our Group Property Director. So let me just take you through what the strategic value proposition is. Um, many of you have been with us for a while, so you'll already know it. But for anybody new, um, what we say is that there is three pillars to the business. Um, and it's all about create, deliver and realize value. So those three pillars, if we just take services, um, obviously the narrative's here for you to read. But um, what I would focus you on is... Um, we're looking at the environmental opportunities through carbon sequestration on over 9,000 acres of land we have in Scotland. We're looking to plant over a million trees up there. And we think there's some benefit from the carbon credits that are generated. Also in services, a big point for everyone at the moment is the inflation resistant nature of those contracts. And again, I'll go into some detail for you to point that out. Hargreaves land, I'm not going to steal any of David's thunder, but I, I think shareholders will be pleasantly surprised about the opportunities that exist within our renewables portfolio. And obviously, I'll talk some time on our joint venture in Germany. It's obviously very important to you as shareholders. It's had a stellar year. Uh, you probably like to understand what's happening and what is going to happen. So I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on that, just giving you a background. So let me just take you over. Because obviously, how did the year finish? Well, again, hopefully everyone's very happy with the outturn. Um, the dividend will increase UK dividend by nearly 25% on the back of these results. Net assets have grown by over a pound. Very important is the cash in hand. Uh, John and I both strongly believe in these challenging times that we face in the next few years that we will uh, look to avoid any bank debt. So we do have a degree of debt. That's leasing debt. And again, I'll talk about that, but that's um, fixed and backs into contracts like um, the HS2. So when you look at the numbers, services, like I said, had a good ramp up of HS2. It will get to its full run rate in the current year we're in now. Hargreaves land, very pleasing to see that Brockwell achieved financial close. And that meant that they've resulted in not only giving us two million pound uh, on completion, but also, more importantly, actually, is the 35-year lease at Westfield at 420,000. David will talk about that in some detail. As I said, Germany did have a stellar uh, year. Um, if you look at brokers' forecasts, it's likely that that will um, drop down. Um, conservative view taken. So very frothy this year. Again, I'll cover that in some detail and give you some flavor. So overall, as a group, I think we're in a very strong position as we enter the current year, and I'll talk about that in some detail. But before that, I'll hand over to John Samuel, Group FD, who'll just go through the numbers for you. John. Afternoon, all. Uh, so on the income statement, we'll just start off with uh, looking at revenue. And as you can see, uh, we've broken out the coal revenue, which remained in 2021 so that you can see that the services business actually grew by nearly 19% in revenue terms. That is predominantly HS2 uh, picking up and it will continue to grow in 2023, not just as a result of HS2, but that will be the prime driver. Um, looking at margins inside services, um, the coal sales created a margin of only £800,000 last year. So if you adjust the 5.1 down by 800000 you end up with a margin of 3.1%, which has actually grown to 47 
and that's an underlying growth in absolute terms of pound note terms of 76% in servicing. In land, revenue is almost irrelevant in land because, of course, land also derives value from its joint venture, the Unity JV, and that is actually why the profit in land has fallen because in 2021, April 2021, the Unity JV closed on a major uh, commercial sale for um, distribution units, and we recognized over four million pounds of profit uh, from the JV. That does not reflect in revenue. I'll come back to HRMS on another slide. Um, moving down, exceptional items and discontinued. As Gordon said, uh, Brockwell uh, completed its financial close on uh, uh, the Westfield location. So that brought in the 2 million of deferred consideration. And there was a very old accrual going back to 2015, which um, has been sitting there and it's now time barred. So that's uh, a non-recurring uh, item, non-cash, of course. Tax is a credit because of balancing allowances that arose following the mining cess uh, cessation of mining last year. I think Gordon's talked about the uh, growth in the dividend, the UK dividend of nearly 25% plus the 12p coming from Germany, and I'll pick that up in a second. If we uh, turn over to the balance sheet, you can see here where capital is allocated. The services business remains a very low capital allocation business. Um, the fixed assets are predominantly plant and the HGVs for the transport fleet, and they're all financed on finance leases. So you really need to net the 18 off against the 29. There isn't anything else of note in that balance sheet other than to say that the working capital cycle, particularly through the earthworks and industrial services businesses, tends to be a negative working capital. In land, we further increased the capital allocated to land, and the biggest single item there is blind wells, included in inventory at 25 million. Last year, it was 21 million. Um, the other uh, item that's worth noting, and we've got another green box there, which just shows the value of the renewables land within our uh, investment properties. Of that 7.1 million, 2 million relates to Westfield and 5 million relates to the wind farm land. And David will pick up both of those things uh, much later on. Germany, I've got a separate slide on, so I'll pass over that. In unallocated, apart from the cash position and deferred tax losses, which really actually belong to the services business, um, the pension scheme is recorded as an asset under IFRS 19, even though we make £2 million per annum contributions to the scheme, which you will see as we turn over to the cash flow. So water flow chart here, taking us from the start of the year to the end. If you add back the 15 million loan to RMS, uh, HRMS, 12 million of which was repaid on the 1st of July, you've basically got a flat position for cash through the year. So where did the cash actually get invested? Well, there are two principal blocks. There's the lease payments, which is effectively the capital expenditure uh, onto HS2, and the investment into the land development opportunities. And the other items are relatively uh, self-explanatory. The dividends there shown 2.3 is the net dividend, net of the 4 million received from Germany, which is passed straight through in the form of that 12p additional dividend. We then have a pretty busy slide on Germany. So I'll take it in three bits. And the top left-hand block is the German income statement in full, in pounds. And if you look at that analysis of revenue, you can see that the growth in revenue was principally in trading. And that's the business that benefited from increase in demand and volumes and in commodity pricing. There was also growth at DK, um, partly due to strong pricing, or in fact, really due to strong pricing as well. Um, if you looked at the profit after tax and split it between the businesses, 
in the current year or the year just ended, HRMS was responsible for 57% of that 32.5 and DK 43%. And last year, the percentages were reversed. So that shows you how much the growth in the profitability from Germany is dependent or has been reliant on this strong commodities demand and strong prices. Nevertheless, DK remained profitable, increased its profits by nearly five million pounds, in fact. And there's some underlying sustainable profits there, which Gordon will talk about later. If you look at the balance sheet on the right hand side, the question that people ask is, why is there not more cash coming out of Germany? Well, there's a simple answer to it, and it's called inventories. That inventories is primarily for the trading business. Uh, the trading business does not take open positions on inventory. All of that inventory is secured with a back-to-back -back sales contract. Um, should the activity level in Germany on trading decrease because of economic conditions or whatever, then there will be a substantial release of cash from the German balance sheet. But right now, that is not happening. We continue for the next several months to see strong demand in Germany, and that's reflected in uh, the forecasts. The bottom left-hand uh, block shows Hargreaves' exposure to the HRMS balance sheet with a large number of retained earnings. Obviously, 4 million of that will be paid back in October before we pass on the 12p additional dividend. Um, of the total loans, as I mentioned before, 12 million has been repaid on the 1st of July. And with that, I'll pass back to Gordon. Thank you, John. So taking the first of the, uh, the businesses services, I would say to people, what's not to like about this? It's pretty easy to get your head around it. Um, on one side, we have a lot of blue chip customers. Uh, there's over 50 term uh, framework contracts. In the industry sectors, you'll see here energy, environmental, infrastructure, and industrial. So blue chip customers, 50 contracts spread over good areas to be in. So that's one thing. The other thing to be aware of is um, these contracts are very inflation proof. If you take HS2, that is effectively a cost plus contract. So actually inflation helps shareholders in terms of the uh, return we get because the, the cost of that contract originally we thought was going to be about 125 million. It's grown to we think at least 200 million. Um, and like I say, it's cost plus open book. As far as transport groups concerned, it's inflation linked reflecting both uh, fuel price and wages. So solid base here with blue chip customers. Um, we did buy a small acquisition called SBU. Uh, only cost us 750. We bought it because it increased our exposure to the utility sector and open doors. But what you'll see in this business is very much a organic growth, steady as you go. One thing that we do say uh, in terms of the position of the group, looking towards the economic outlook, we will not look to move into any bank debt. So don't worry about a situation where we look to do any acquisitions. Um, we are sitting in a safe position and we will maintain that for the foreseeable till uh, all this turbulence disappears. But that services, like I said, it's pretty easy to understand. Um, I'll hand over to David, who will talk about land. Thanks, Gordon. Afternoon, everybody. So Hargreaves Land, um, we operate in a range of different uh, markets. So really can be divided into four sectors. Uh, we've got the multi-phase master developer uh, where we have three active sites, uh, Blindles, UT, Westfield. These are large sites. So those three sites combined uh, cover over 2,000 acres. And here we, we get a lot of long-term visibility on both residential and commercial development. It gives us a pipeline of projects uh, spreading over uh, many years. We, in addition to that, do bespoke one-off commercial developments. These are typically retail warehousing. Uh, these are forward sold and pre-let, so our actual direct capital exposure is relatively limited. Um, we're involved in strategic land, which is purely adding value through the planning process. We typically option up sites, 
uh, run them through the planning process, secure a planning, and then we'll sell through normally to house builders without ever owning the site and simply recover our costs and take a margin on the added value. And then finally, the renewables piece, uh, this has come, has come out of the former mining land. We've been quietly building that up over the last few years and have started to talk about it as these opportunities now started to come to fruition. Uh, turn over the page. Um, so in terms of in the year, um, it's been a busy year, particularly in setting up transactions for this coming year and beyond. Um, Blind Wells, uh, this predominantly housing scheme is now uh, well in its way, well advanced. Uh, to give you an idea, we have 400, 400 plots that are actually already sold uh, with houses coming out the ground to a range of house builders. And we've got another just over 400 plots which are either subject to agreed terms or are actually exchange contracts which will be um, com sales are complete this year. Uh, so you can see that the actual rate of sale is ramping up. And then we've got a further uh, phase of 130 plots, uh, which we've just taken to the markets now. And they will that will complete early part of next financial year we're expecting. Uh, at Unity, um, work continues on the upfilling contract, uh, which is a cost plus contract that we, we were awarded following sale of the large commercial site. Uh, previous financial year before last. And then we've now secured um, detailed planning permission for one of the two large logistics units, which we secured a conditional forward sale contract for last year. So you'll see that stuff come out the ground this year. Um, and then our first residential phase is now subject to a detailed planning application. Um, and that's where we, we've got two contracts, one with Harren Homes, one with Bellway. Uh, and again, work on those expected to start before the end of this financial year. So again, a long-term flow of work going forward, which will start to see some revenue coming through in this year. And then finally, Westfield. This is one where um, it started life out as an overcast colliery. Um, we've been awaiting the financial close of the Engie for Waste facility. Uh, that was achieved last Christmas. That triggered the grant of ground lease, uh, which is a 50-year lease. It's got a tenant break at year 35, so the minimum term is 35 years. Uh, we get £400,000 per annum and it's annually index linked. And as part <coughs> of that contract, uh, we agree to infrastructure that plot, which is only nine acres out of the total site. Um, and we're also infrastructuring a further 40 acres on top of that. Uh, and in active discussion with a range of commercial occupiers who are looking to acquire land uh, for direct development. Uh, so we're hoping to be able to announce further transactions going through the year. So those are the three large uh, projects where we're working through to actually deliver schemes into this year and beyond. Um, turning over the page, this is a slide we use on the capital markets day. This one's a blind rolls just to emphasize the sort of steady reoccurring revenue that these large schemes can generate. So um, obviously we're in FY23 at the moment. Uh, plot five is the sale that we've agreed with Avant and is currently going through legals. Plot 11 is the sale we've already contracted with Ogilvy uh, and should complete next month. And then the sale, with the plot we've just taken to market is plot four uh, and that is expected to be early part of FY24. So it gives you an idea we're on programme and continue to work the time scale we've set out. Um, over the slide to the, the Unity slide. Again, this is another capital market slide. Uh, the same theme really where we've got a, um, a steady flow of transactions we're anticipating over the next 10, 15 years. Um, the 29 acres is the commercial scale where we've just received a detailed planning set for one of the buildings and that will start on site this year. And then the 19 acres is the contracts that we've entered into with Bellway and Harren Homes in FY24. Um, and then beyond that, you'll see um, a steady flow of commercial transactions which will uh, begin to be overtaken by the quantum of residential development. And that's simply a function of the fact that the commercial transactions tend to be much lumpier and are done early on, where the residential tends to be much more steady uh, because you can only sell so many houses in one location at any time in a year. Over the page onto the, the pipeline and outlook. Um, so at the moment, we've got just over 4,000 uh, residential plots with planning consent of which we've got 780, which are actually subject to agreed terms or contracts. And then crucially, we've got just under 3,000 new plots, which we're promoting through the planning process at the moment, which will generate a pipeline, and that's across Scotland and England. On the retail side, which is the bespoke one-off developments, uh, we completed 44,000 square feet of forward-funded retail warehouse uh, last year. And We've got a further 35,000 square feet, which we're working on, which should start to come out the ground this year. 
And then we've just secured a site for a further 70,000 square feet, which will be probably something that we'll start to talk about next year. So again, a steady pipeline of those. It's very limited capital involved in, in those projects uh, because they're forward funded. And then on the industrial logistics side, again, in addition to the 220 acres of um, we've got consent for, which is circa three and a half million square feet, um, and the 560,000 square feet we've already got signed up and contracted. We've got a further one and a half million square feet of space, which we're taking through the planning process, which again will feed the pipeline going forward. And in terms of our experience of the market outlook at the moment, um, we're seeing demand from house builders for residential land is, remains very robust. We're not seeing any weakening of uh, pricing. Uh, and indeed, if anything, we've seen an improvement, certainly in the, the level of inquiries um, and the actual number of parties that are looking to bid for sites. Um, and we've seen a steady improvement in land values, which has without doubt offset the inflation of pressures to date. Um, the same can be largely said of the industrial logistics market, where again, we've got very healthy occupied demand. Both the residential and the logistics market suffer from um, really a, a fundamental shortage of space, which is underpinning the market and the values uh, going forward. And as I mentioned previously, that in terms of cost inflation, so far um, increasing pricing has kept place with inflation, so we haven't been too badly hit from that side. Over the page to renewables, uh, we, we started talking about this in some detail at Capital Markets Day earlier in the year. Um, so these, to remind people, these are um, our existing formal mining sites where we've been quietly working on a range of agreements with wind farm developers um, over the last few years. Uh, these essentially are either are really in the form of ground leases. So we're not involved in the development of the wind farms. We don't have any capital or risk exposure on that side. But what we do is we grant uh, them ground leases. They're typically 28 year ground leases. Uh, and we get a percentage of the revenue that is generated from the sale of power into the grid. Uh, so that means that the income is largely, is long term, it's predominantly index linked. Um, and at the moment, we have all the 10 sites we've identified and progressed are all under contract, all have consent, planning consent, and all have grid connections, which determines the, the time scales for delivery. Um, and the 28 year nature of the income with index linking turns into, into a new to grade investment uh, leases, which effectively reflected the investment yield which is quoted previously. Um, we've obviously also got the 35 year minimum term energy for waste lease, uh, which is an interesting play in renewables. And beyond that, we're now into detailed discussion with a range of additional opportunities on our land. Uh, these uh, range from wind farm extensions uh, to new access agreements, and then, interesting enough, as the market has um, expanded, we're now in discussion with companies looking to create hydrogen hydrolyzers, basically where they, they run power through water uh, to generate hydrogen, uh, and they, they want access to cheap power near existing wind farms. And also battery storage is really coming into its own, where these are taking fairly substantial size, again, on ground leases uh, for battery storage. So again, we, we see this portfolio expanding over the next few years, and we certainly are uh, seeing a lot of investor interest in this side of it. There's not a market that we see uh, weakening anytime soon. Uh, this slide is, is really one we use on Capital Markets Day, just to give you a, a timeline for the renewables projects we've got under contract. Um, the dates are all based on the grid connections that those wind farm developers have to hit, so they're fairly sacrosanct. So you'll see these steadily coming through over the next two or three years. Um, when we hit those dates, they then become income producing uh, with a lease. So that's when we're, we're in a position where we've got um, income we can crystallize into a value. And in terms of how you value these things, um, we put this slide up previously, which really gives you the fairly convoluted form as to how, how investors will value these. Uh, the two variables are really the strike price, which is the value that investors get for the power they sell into the grid or to uh, third party users. Uh, that ranges hugely from roughly between 45 and 95 pounds a foot, and it generally isn't getting any cheaper. Um, the utilization is, put it bluntly, how windy the sites are. Uh, there isn't that much range, it's 30 to 35%. And then really the, the only other thing to be particularly aware of is the share of the income. Um, our agreements uh, range from between one and four uh, percent with the ability to sort of double those percentages um, mid term of the lease. 
so again, it gives you an idea of how you can actually work out what these things might potentially be worth uh, once they all start to come on stream. And with that, I'll hand you back to Gordon. Thank you very much, David. So just taking you through HRMS, obviously it's a stellar performer this year. I just want to recap for everyone the business. So remember, it started as a trading business. It asset backed itself with a coal pulverization plant and DK recycling. So how they all work together, um, HRMS will provide the coal to the pulverization plant. It'll provide the coke and coal into DK, and it will also trade out the zinc and pig iron. HRMS was already a pig iron trader uh, in its own rights, so it brought that expertise to DK and has helped to improve the marketing. Remember, though, that we have 49.9% of the voting shares, but we get 86% as shareholders of the economic benefit. So the results are not consolidated um, into the group. Just over the page, talking about trading, what this... What we've always said about trading, and to be clear, it's never made a loss in all the years it's been part of the group. Why is that? Because it doesn't take principal risk. It backs the back. What it's all about is a volume of tons multiplied by a margin. What's happened, where you can see here, is that they've benefited by strong economic activity in 21, 22 in Europe. Also, though, they've benefited by being able to trade around the DK and the CPP assets. One of the examples I give people is that if you can imagine before they would have bought 20,000 tons of material. Now, because they've got DK, they can buy 40. That means a bigger ship, more economies of scale, more cost competitive. Therefore, they can increase market share. So what you will see, uh, and brokers are forecasting a downturn. Brokers are actually forecasting a quite significant downturn next year, reflecting the uncertainties of the economy. So they're nearly looking at a 50% step down in profit on the German business. Um, but what we're saying is, even if you have a downturn, it won't go back to the levels trading was before because it has the step up benefits of trading around these assets. Like I say, it's back to back multiplied by margin. Um, and one mismatch that we've been talking to shareholders about on the roadshow is that in the broker's forecasts, they are assuming that there'll be a downturn in trading. If that happens, as John mentioned, you have a huge amount of inventory and that inventory will turn into cash. And that cash at the moment doesn't appear anywhere because it just stays in Germany. That's unlikely to happen. We won't build it up on the balance sheet. But at the moment, we've got a very conservative position used by the brokers in their forecasts. So that's the trading business. This is probably for shareholders the disappointing part of the group. So we bought, built this grinding plant um, and the plan was to uh, replace lignum brown coal. All works perfectly well. Um, it's been proven with lots of customers. At the moment, it's doing about 100,000 tons, which is break even. The big advantage this place has is when the lignum brown coal mines close, people will switch to this product. The problem is, as you've seen in the press, the Germans have announced that because of the problems with gas, they are not rushing to close down their uh, lignum brown coal mines. So look, this is poised, ready to go. At the moment, it's breaking even. Um, but we hope once climate change goes back up the agenda, uh, that the they will review the lignum brown coal mines, and then this is ready to capitalize on the opportunity. Just over the page, so DK Recycling. Remember, this is a recycling business. So it takes over half a million ton of dust, which would have otherwise gone into landfill. Um, there is no problem with the dust. There are more dust than we can cope with. We can only do 500,000 tons. We have another steel plant wants to supply us to improve its green credentials. Not worried about that. Coal and coke, like I said, we trade that through from HRMS, put it into DK. That goes into our blast furnace. The positive thing is when you run a blast furnace, you do throw off gas. That gas goes into our own power station that exports some to the grid, but the main issue is to say that means we are energy self-sufficient. So we're not exposed to electricity prices. We generate all our own electricity. What you get out is zinc and pig iron and energy. Uh, and I will talk on the next slide about where, where those markets are going. So the inputs are secure. Um, what about the outputs? Well, pig iron price is always correlated very strongly to coke. Now we are 
Ford sold on about 60,000 tons of our pig iron at prices we're happy with, and we've underpinned that with the Coke purchases. So that's okay. And that's why I probably think we'll have a quite strong H1. Um, where it goes in H2 is a question, what will happen with pig iron prices? But we see that Coke prices tend to track as well, so that should compensate. On zinc, we have these very high zinc prices that were experienced. We've taken a decision to go into the market and hedge 50% of the volume that we produce at 3,100 right out till May. One of our contracts is um, not hedgeable, so we'll, we're in discussions because that's up for renew in October. When it's renewed, we'll look to probably hedge a bit more of that to protect the downside for shareholders. Just over the page, we talked about the outputs, the inputs, the operating cost in the middle. These are the things that we've done since we acquired the business. They weren't capital intensive. They were just good business sense. And that means that we have reduced the cost of base effectively by about 10 million. So we believe that even through the stresses of recessionary pressures, this business will be resilient. A question that was asked previously on Roadshow has been, what about the Russian gas situation? It's very high profile at the moment. And the answer to that is, that at the moment we use a relatively small amount of gas because we generate predominantly a lot ourselves. We do buy some natural gas um, and the team at the moment are looking to put some liquefied gas tanks in sight so that we can be self-sufficient. That will be more expensive and we're working on all the details as we speak, but we do have contingencies in place we're working through to deal with that challenge should it arise. So that's the DK piece. So now on to the next slide. What we call hot topics, the things that uh, we're being asked about a lot. So inflation, as I said before, in services, we're comfortable. Germany, I think I've talked about in some detail, and David's talked about land. There is obviously the group overhead and the divisional overhead, which is not recoverable through contracts. But we've done a rough rule of thumb for you that 1% increase maybe costs about 100 grand. COVID-19, um, I think you've seen that we've demonstrated we traded through that very well. Interest rates, that's why we said we, we do not want to have any bank borrowings um, because we're concerned about where they're moving. So we're not exposed to that. Where we do have leasing debt, and that's predominantly actually on HS2, which again is cost plus, um, then we have fixed prices. So we think we're covered there. Energy costs for the UK group is about 750. So it would have an impact, but nothing that we can't manage. Germany, like I said, it's got its own power. So it generates, so that's a positive. Um, climate change is definitely lower on the agenda than it was probably 12 months ago, uh, but we believe there's opportunities to add value. Look at all these old brownfield sites, 9,000 acres, suitable for trees. We're looking to plant nearly a million trees up there. Um, we're just working through the process of getting forestry grants to do it. So that'll be quite interesting in the long, medium to long term, because you actually get paid for the carbon sequestration. Um, the German business obviously has a very positive green agenda from the point of view we're recycling half a million ton of product that would normally um, go into landfill. So just over the page, as I laughingly said, you know, we ESG has dropped down the agenda a bit. Everyone's worried about the risks out there, but we do take ESG seriously and I encourage you as shareholders to take it seriously. It will come back. But what's important as well for us is retention of staff. You can imagine in the world we live in at the moment that there is a lot of pressure. So we do need to look after our employees. Um, hopefully you'll be pleased to know that, you know, in the budgets this year, we put a 6% pay increase through. We made sure there was death in service for all our employees. Um, and we adjusted some of the pensions, which we think will help retention because obviously this business needs good quality individuals. Over the page. So what's the outlook? Services um, has the growth in HS2. So this coming year, we'll probably do about 40 million when it hits full run rate. So next year is a full run rate. Um, big things you're looking for is the announcements on lower Thames and Sizewell. So both look as if they're going ahead. Um, we think we're in prime position because we have the competency because we're on HS2. But we also tick a localism box. So our Earthworks Business Blackwell is based in Essex and it's on the doorstep of both these projects, which we think will uh, bear us in good stead. Um, we're hoping that one of them gets announced in this coming year. 
uh, we'll obviously update shareholders through an RNS when that happens, um, but the profits would take a couple of years before they start flowing through. HS2 gives us a lovely underpin in there, but the rest of the businesses are doing very well. And like I say, they sit in an environment which we're very comfortable about. Land, I think, you know, please spend the time to look at David's slides on renewables. Don't underestimate the value you as shareholders have in that business. Um, there's a lot coming through and it's going to be exciting to talk about that over the next few years. HRMS is, uh, has done stellarly well. Can't take that away from it. Uh, when you look at brokers forecasts, you'll see what's effectively happening for next year and the year after. The German business comes off. They're, they're looking at it coming off by nearly 50%, partly compensated by land getting into its stride. Remember, two years ago, David had a really good year. He brought forward sales, which made the year that's just finished a lower year. Now it's all systems go on all of the big three developments. So you're going to see this regular recurring income stream. Um, and Germany, like I said, had a difficult year, uh, had a very good year, sorry, will now come down and then even out in two years from now, we think, because there's still some froth going through. So don't be surprised if H1 isn't quite a strong H1. Um, we're quietly confident in the position there. It's H2 that's more difficult to predict. Just over the page in conclusion, one thing I would say is please be reassured we do have a very strong board that sits over us. Those of you who track Roger McDowell, who's our chairman, will know his reputation. Um, very competent chairman, one of the best chairman I've ever had. Alongside him, we have Nick Mills, who represents our largest shareholder. So there's a lot of scrutiny on what we do, which I, I welcome. Um, we have this strong balance sheet with no debt. I think you can see the visibility of our pipeline, which is positive. Um, and of course, for some of you, it's important. Our dividend in the UK has gone up by nearly 25% um, on, on the English part of it. So we have these three strong pillars. I do think they complement each other, and I'll pick that up later under questions. So that is the presentation. Uh, if everyone's that, happy. That, that, Gordon, that's great. And, and thank you to the rest of the team for updating investors uh, this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. But just while the company take a few moments to review those questions submitted already, I'd like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your uh, Investor Meet Company dashboard. Um, Stephen, as you can see, there's a number of questions that have been submitted by investors throughout today's presentation. Firstly, thank you to all of you for your engagement this afternoon. Uh, but perhaps, Stephen, if I may, just hand back to you to read out the questions and then obviously hand them uh, out as appropriate, and I'll pick up from you at the end. Sure, no problem. So first question is from Jake. Um, I think we might have covered this one, Gordon, but what, what will be the likely impact on the company in the, like, in the event that Russian gas supplies to Germany are disrupted over the next several months? Yeah, so that, that answer is, um, that's why we were looking to put the liquefied gas tanks in. It will increase the cost base, but we think we can continue to produce. The big question is then what happens to the economy in general out in Europe, um, and that's difficult to predict. But, you know, our customers are foundries. People will still have cars. Foundries will still be working, and we've hedged the zinc. So hopefully we've taken the appropriate steps. And remember... Brokers forecasts are nearly a 50% reduction in profits over this year. So I think there's some contingency built in there. Okay, we've got a couple of questions from, from Mark now. Um, first question is around the strategic logic of the three pillars. Uh, it doesn't feel they fit together particularly well as they are. Why, why would we not split them out and divest the parts? And Mark, money to share Mark that's a, a very good question. Um, you've got to remember where we came from. So. No, you wouldn't have started here. Remember, we were a coal business that's morphed and the most important thing was to protect the balance sheet. We now have worked our way through that. We have these three strong, if you don't want to call them um, pillars, you can call them business units. Um, I think it's a valid comment. I've always believed personally, if you look at property, a lot of property companies um, worried about the downturn have investment grade properties that give them a rent. So when there's a downturn in property, the rents, which only have six, 7% yield maybe, cover the overhead of the business. We have a much more efficient balance sheet. If there was a downturn in the property sector, the services business can cover the overhead so we don't have to sell property assets at a distress. So I think they work very well together. 
Germany's a valid question that sits separately. Um, and people will know that we looked at um, selling Germany uh, a couple of years ago. Um, the point was that we looked at it and thought it was important that we proved the business model, delivered some efficiency changes, um, and saw where we ended up. So we're working through that process. Uh, to be honest, as I always say to everyone, look, everything's for sale if, if the price is right. But at the moment, the three businesses are working well, but it doesn't mean they'll always be all three. Uh, next question from Mark is, what are the anticipated effects on us if HS2 is cancelled in whole or in part? Uh, again, interesting question. Uh, Mark, take my word for it. If you go down to Buckingham and look at this big scar across the landscape that we have extracted, um, there's no way any politician is going to stop what's going to Birmingham. That, I really do believe, will carry on. It, they've made such a mess in terms of the countryside. Um, they've bought a lot of land. They're in too deep. Um, so our project that we're talking about just is to Birmingham. So we are, uh, I don't see Birmingham stopping, so we're not exposed to a stopping risk. And uh, next, post, next question is from another Mark, but a different one. Uh, can you expand on your framework agreements and what rev revenue visibility you have? And do you see this expanding? Do you want to do one for a change, John? So um, we actually only have about half a dozen framework agreements, but we have a lot of term contracts. And these are all in services. And I think on the services slide, it shows we've got 75% of the revenue expectation for FY23 already secured. Um, the, the frameworks vary in length. Some of them go through to 2028. Um, others are typically more typically sort of two or uh, three year frameworks. Often they have one or two year extension periods. Uh, the term contracts similarly last for more usually three to five years, the term contracts. So, and then of course, because there's over 50 of them, they all have different start and finish points. Um, but uh, we generally would expect to have something north of 66% of the, of the revenue in services uh, secured by either term contracts or frameworks when we go into the new financial year. Okay, and the, the, the next question is from Vaughan, and it's in relation to the dividend from Germany, the 12p. We've stated that the dividend will be in place for four or five years. After that four or five years, if no further profits were to be made, how much of the dividend would be available for the following four or five years? Try well, to take that. You take that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you're right that we talked about uh, four or five years originally because we were looking at the then undistributed profits, which the German business was not permitted to pay because of the debt that it had taken out to build the grinding plant until after May, 2021. And there was, there are covenants related to the German balance sheet in connection with that loan for the grinding plant. And so we looked at what was an affordable level of dividend and the, turned out to be this four million pound, 12 people share. Uh, and that's where we came up with that uh, four. Um, obviously the German business has continued to make profits subsequently. So the actual sum of dividend that comes out from Germany, other than the 12p, is really dependent upon Germany's own cash requirements. As Gordon said earlier on, if the trading business were to suffer a substantial downturn because of demand or commodity prices or whatever, and go back to what we might call a normalized level, if such a thing ever existed, then free cash becomes available. So it's not really about paying 12p for the next 10 years or whatever. I suspect that if there was a large amount of free cash came back from Germany, then we'd look to distribute it to shareholders more rapidly than taking 10 years over it at 12 p a time. And a question from David for David on, on land. Um, do, do you think about starting some of our own wind farm projects in order to secure a larger share of the value added potentially with Bavar or? Yeah, it's partners? certainly something uh, that's on the radar. Historically, we did actually have a renewables division which we spun off. Um, but obviously we're now in a slightly different position. So we are looking at that. Um, I think particularly in respect of the 
Um, the other renewable opportunities, things like battery storage, things like hydrogen hydrolyzer, I think they they have quite a broad range of possible opportunities. So it's certainly something that we're looking at. Uh, we've got three more questions on the list. So the next one's again from, from David, but in relation to Germany. So uh, if Germany's, with Germany turning on coal generation power, uh, does this further increase the difficulty with carbon pulverization plants capacity as coals become more expensive? Yeah, I mean, the the because coal prices have gone up, it makes it more difficult for the grinding plant. As I said, it's got 100,000 contracted for the next three years. Um, it will break even, so so it won't get any worse. But you're right, if coal prices stay high, it won't get any better. And a linked question from John. If the, if the German government restarts mothballed coal-fired power stations, could they use pulverised coal from the grinding plant? No, if, if they restart their coal stations, they will um, just buy pure, neat coal. Uh, and the final question. Um, what about the risk of not having enough workforce in the short to medium term? Is this a risk for Hargreaves? Uh, I hope, David, we, we, we answered that from my point that, um, you know, we, we, we've been sensible. I think a 6% pay increase was right. We've looked at uh, conditions. Um, so we feel there was a, like everybody, we had a shortage of lorry drivers. Um, that was a challenge, but we're now stabilised. So I think never be complacent. But we feel that we've been fair with our people with a 6% increase. At the moment, we're not sure of individuals. Okay. That's great. Thank okay. you very much, John. And uh, thank you very much indeed to, sorry, the rest of the uh, the team. Um, Gordon, as you know, investor feedback, um, I know, is in particularly important to the company. And I'll shortly redirect investors to give you their thoughts and expectations. Uh, but before doing so, I wondered if I may, um, Gordon, just ask you for a few closing comments before I redirect investors to give you their feedback. No, well, look, thank you very much, everyone, for your time and attention. It's much appreciated. I think it's something that probably Hargreaves neglected to, in the past, deal with the retail investors. So, look, we're here. We're always available. Please feel free to contact us if we can provide any colour to what's going on. Thank you for your time and attention. That's great. Thank you, Gordon, John, Stephen. Thank you very much indeed for updating investors this afternoon. Companies ask investors not to close this session as we'll now automatically redirect you for the opportunity to provide feedback in order the company can better understand your views and expectations. This may take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Hargreaves Services PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending this afternoon's presentation and may I wish you all a very pleasant afternoon.